first thing I, I need to say really is that, uh, and this won't be a surprise to anybody in the audience here, is that Conley's stature uh, grows the further we get away from his, uh, his life. You know, his, his, the, the, the popularity, the way that Conley's image has been used, his legacy has been sort of appropriated by all sorts of people who would have detested what he'd done during, during the course of his lifetime. The way that all that's evolved really stands in sharp contrast to the uh, obscurity, to the marginalization, and to the poverty that Conley and his family endured for most of his, uh, his uh, political life. He was reviled by the employer class up and down the length of this country, particularly in Dublin, uh, because of his role in uh, the 1913 uh, lockout, and in, and in Belfast where he was involved in, in a similar uh, important uh, labor of people. Reviled by the employer class, denounced by the church not only years after his death, but in the course of his own uh, lifetime, uh, and of course uh, denounced as well by the media. All that changes, and it's not a, it's not a story in particular to Colony. The way that uh, revolutionaries, after their death, the ideas that they stood for sort of hollowed out and a kind of a false, uh, uh, superficial image of these people is held up to, to the world uh, and, and to present a sort of a safe image of, uh, of the, the, the dead revolutionary. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, who worked alongside Conley in the United States, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, great Irish-American uh, uh, trade union organizer and then uh, socialist, communist, uh, her partner and herself were involved in the IWW in the United States. Gurley Flynn remembers, and it's the anecdote that I always remember, she says, it was a pathetic sight to see Conley standing there poorly clad, selling his little newspaper outside some union hall in New York and the time that Conley lived in the United States. And really, that's the way that Conley lived most of his life. I mean, he, he enjoyed these great upsurges in, in working class struggle, as in 1913 uh, and, and otherwise. But for the most part, Conley found himself on the outside looking in, attempting to organize a working class uh, mass movement against the current of, 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 of politics uh, in his day. And that's the situation that most of, of us find ourselves in, those of us who throw ourselves up against uh, the system. It's a familiar story. I've got about 15 minutes, I think. I want to make three main points about Conley himself that I think are important to bear in mind, and then uh, about his politics, and then say something about what I think they might, uh, uh, how they might help us think about uh, the events of the 1960s, 1970s. And in saying that, I would, or in going through some of this, I'm aware that there are people in the room who, uh, obviously, I didn't. <laughs> Uh, I arrived in this country, uh, uh, you know, fairly recently. There are people who are close to some of the events I'll talk about that, that I am. Uh, I don't claim to be an expert on them, but I want to make some points. As somebody who's been involved in, in socialist politics on both sides of the Atlantic for about uh, uh, 30 years now. Uh, first point about Conley, really, is that he spent the bulk of his political life organizing or attempting to organize a mass movement among working class people. A mass movement among ordinary people, uh, uh, particularly in Ireland, but also uh, in other parts of the world, including the United States, where the day he arrives, he begins, uh, he makes no apologies, become, throws himself into the working class movement there. That is, he spends most of his time organizing around what we would consider pretty mundane issues, wages, terms, and conditions. You know, the unglamorous sort of daily grind of trying to get workers to stand up for their rights, to stand together, and to fight back against their bosses. He's remembered most often, and especially in the, in the media, for his role in 1916, but uh, he's devoted, uh, for the most part, to building a mass movement among the Irish working class uh, throughout his political life. Now, for Conley, this didn't mean he wasn't a labor bureaucrat, a labor leader, somebody who uh, stuck himself in an office somewhere and waited for the phone call to come in and tell him, you know, how many workers have been organized today. For Conley, this didn't mean that he shied away from the most difficult and contentious uh, political questions of the day. And, and, and in fact, the opposite is the, tr is the truth, that Conley threw himself into uh, some of the most uh, difficult uh, and thorny sort of issues that socialists uh, could face uh, in, in his own day. In, in terms of the big questions of the day, of course, Conley is one of a handful of uh, socialists who stand up and take a principal position uh, opposing uh, the First World War, opposing the Great Slaughter that much of the socialist movement collapses uh, in the face of, but he also takes up the critical issues in Irish working class politics, and particularly his work, uh, his writings around sectarianism in the North, 
his, uh, you know, his prescient sort of uh, understanding of what partition would mean for, uh, for uh, upholding uh, sectarian divisions, class divisions, uh, the weakness of the labor movement in, in, in Ireland, all that really is uh, really a, a treasure for, uh, for revolutionaries in Ireland uh, uh, today that we need to uh, hold, hold close. In his approach to all these political questions, I would argue that Conley begins from the perspective of the working class movement that he that he that he's aimed, aims to uh, build. If you look at his writings on partition, for in, for example, they're not about some idea of uh, you know a, a, a green flag and a republic somewhere. And of course, he writes directly against that that notion. His, his critique of partition, which he sees coming down the line, is about the effect that partition will have in cementing the sectarian divisions that have been uh, fostered over, over a period of centuries uh, in this country. He begins from the perspective of the working class movement. The same thing is true, I don't know how many people, I, I hope some of uh, us have had a chance to have a look back at what Colney wrote about uh, royal visits or the coronation of you know, Edward VII. His writings on, on royalty. And, it, and, and, and the way that Irish workers to, should respond to it. If you read any of these, 95% of what he writes in that is about the class question, about the social questions, about the way that uh, this, the symbols of, uh, of the old order, symbols of the ruling class, hold up uh, inequality in the society that we live in, the way that they diminish the self-image, uh, the, the self-confidence of working class people. So he approaches even these questions. I'm not saying he's oblivious to the way that empire impacts on Ireland. But it begins really from the, from the perspective of the working class movement uh, in, in Ireland. Uh, the third thing is that, uh, the third issue is that while Conley spends lots of his life um, defending the idea of Irish self-determination, makes no apologies for it, and, and neither do I think he should have, it's also true, we need, we need to look at the other side of that. And he spends a great deal of his time offering up a critique, putting together a critique of, uh, of Irish nationalism and of bourgeois uh, sort of manifestations of Irish nationalism, of the way in which the home rulers, the nationalists, uh, and other, uh, other forces will, will inevitably betray uh, an all-out fight for self-determination, and if, therefore, in his view, the Irish working class, the only, uh, the true repository of the hopes for, uh, for self-determination in Ireland. So, Somebody who defends our self-determination, but also offers up a powerful critique of, of, uh, of nationalism. So that's three broad arguments about Comey. He located himself in the working class movement. He took up the most difficult political questions of the day. He defended self-determination, but also offered up a powerful critique of, uh, of, uh, of nationalism. How does this record of agitation on Comey's part uh, inform an analysis a socialist analysis, a left-wing analysis of developments in Ireland in the uh, 1960s and 1970s. And here I'm relying mostly on what I've read, uh, what I've uh, thought about uh, in trying to come to grips with, with where we're at uh, myself over recent years. First of all, the context in which uh, events develop in the mid and late uh, 1960s. The first in the South, in particular, you have a Labour Party that, would, that has long since distanced itself from the tradition of Colman, which has made its peace with uh, the social order, and which is probably among the most right-wing of all the social democratic parties in Europe. A conservative, and a, an especially conservative, brand of Labourism in the, in the uh, South of Ireland, which allows... Uh, one of the two main bourgeois parties, Fianna Foyle, to position itself as the kind of populist embodiment of, uh, of Irish nationalism. And to win the votes over and over again, to win the votes of workers on the basis of that kind of populist uh, green appeal. So a rotten sort of Labour Party, uh, a, a, a mainstream bourgeois party that appeals to and, and manages to, to enter the space left by the Labour Party and craft an appeal to a working class people that delivers votes for them time and time again. And you can say it really, that only really came to an end in the last few months, isn't it? A few, 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 the last year or so. In the North, of course, you have a labor movement that's extremely weak and divided. In terms of its organization, for the most part, its, its main strength lies in the engineering and shipyard works, which are overwhelmingly Protestant 
uh, and, and very often uh, segregated, uh, where, where Catholic workers are not really uh, represented in large numbers in the uh, labor market. This also means that labor is, the working class is politically impotent in the North, has very little, no influence on, on uh, politics, even within the framework of the six town state. So, for instance, you have unionist opposition to Higher Education Act, or to the NHS, or to any number of the sort of, you know, basic social reforms that labor governments in, in, in England are able to pass in the 1940s. The Unionist Party is able to block them or hold them off for, for some time. Labor, unable to uh, assert itself, mount any opposition, even to these, you know, or, or, or mount any defense of these, uh, you know, social reforms, basically. Labor's weak and divided. Republicans in the mid '60s, as people <coughs> even know, reeling from the failure of the uh, of the border campaign, uh, for the most part, marginal, even in places like uh, which later become you know uh, strongholds of Republicans in West Belfast. Republicans uh, fairly marginalized in the mid '60s, uh, demoralized, and at least judging by Brian Hanley's book, politically pretty incoherent on a national level. You get left-wing elements inside the Republican movement, in a minority, I would argue, but you also get editorials in the main publications of the Republican uh, newspapers, you know, looking back nostalgically at Franco-Spain, uh, defending the apartheid regime in South Africa, uh, 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 ambivalent or opposed to the revolution uh, that's taken place in Cuba. You get this mixture of elements, uh, political incoherence, I would say, and the ranks of the mainstream Republican movement uh, in the uh, in the main in, 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 by the mid 1960s, the movement, if you were to characterize it, you'd have to say it was dominated. I would argue by conservative uh, nationalism and, for the most part, close to uh, the church. In this context, there's an attempt to inject uh, left wing politics and to reorient the Republican movement towards paying more attention, agitating around social issues. People are familiar with this. This eventually, you know, becomes the the, the, the the official Republican movement. But in the mid '60s, when it's pushed out by Goulding and others, uh, I, I think the left would have uh, some of the people who later uh, leave the movement would have welcomed this turn towards uh, greater <coughs> social agitation. Even before 1969, this turn to social agitation is uh, <coughs> understood by some or read by some, as a retreat from, uh, you know, a, 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 a commitment to pursuing uh, national independence, a commitment to the national question. And you have two groups, I was going to say one group, but Karen uh, informed me on the way down to that, uh, this morning. Uh, I have to nuance the argument. You have traditionalists, many of them uh, attached to a kind of militarist outlook, who uh, reject the move into social agitation. You also get individual, young people especially, left wing, uh, influenced by left wing politics, who would have uh, especially grown hesitant about the shift that's underway in the, in the movement, because it does appear that there's a move away from uh, any uh, engagement on, on the national question. So a, a sort of a, a coalition emerging between a large number of traditionals, a small number of left wing activists. All this explodes really and comes to a head in the traumatic events of, uh, of August uh, 1969. And of course, it's building up the <coughs> tensions around the civil rights agitation before that. But it explodes and it has a. It means really that for all sections of the left, sections of the Republican movement, uh, are compelled to try to come to terms with what the pogroms of August 69 reveal about the nature of the northern state the possibilities for uh, working class politics, the possibilities for social reform, either within the six county state or, uh, or with the, all this says about partition. For most of the people around the student movement uh, who would have associated themselves with the new left, you know, the generation of 68, the pogroms of August 69 really uh, re disorient them uh, completely. People's Democracy, for instance, had insisted that the border was irrelevant, that, the, that it was possible to build a reform campaign within the confines of the 
uh, six county state, or at least the bulk of PD argue this. And that's, for many of them, of course, uh, the, the, you know, the images of what takes place uh, in, in Belfast and then in Derry uh, means that their whole idea uh, of the way forward is, th is thrown into the air, and it's no longer uh, possible. And it means, that really, for that section of the New Left, they're basically paralyzed politically in terms of making any serious intervention in the, uh, in the events from uh, 69 forward. For the labor movement generally, in the North, the old recipe of evading the problem of sectarianism, which is the way that the Northern labor movement has always is, is traditionally dealt with, basically we, we sort of keep the sectarian genie in the bottle by not talking about it when we're in mixed company. That's the way, really, that the labor movement had traditionally dealt with the thing. We evade the question of sectors, we duck the, sector, the question of sectors, and hopefully it will just go away or not arise. Really, that's impossible after August 69. A labor movement that doesn't <coughs> confront directly the problem of uh, divisions in the, uh, in the northern working class is uh, due to uh, irrelevance, and really the, the northern labor movement is irre irrelevant, for the most part, from uh, 69 and the early 70s. Uh, onward until until uh, very recently. Within the Republican movement, of course, and people will know this history way better than I, I, I suspect, there's a split that emerges, and I would argue there's a, there's a, there's a paradox at the heart of uh, this split uh, 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 as things develop into the early and mid-1970s. The group that is formally uh, on the left, or wh which adheres to a formally adheres to a left-wing vision of politics in the crisis of, of August 1969 yeah, is exposed to at least large sections of the nationalist working class as conservative, as unwilling to defend them in the face of uh, vicious uh, pogroms. <coughs> as things develop, uh, the officials uh, basically move towards an accommodation with the, uh, I mean this doesn't happen overnight, but move towards an accommodation with the northern state and actually uh, see themselves really as uh, a bulwark against uh, challenges, uh, especially uh, armed challenges to the uh, state. The organization or that group of people who split from the officials and who would have been in formal terms, if you look at their politics, people like Billy McGee and others, you know, um, and, 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 and it's a suggestion it's maybe a mixed, more mixed bag than I've, uh, than I've read it, but formally they, they embrace fairly right-wing politics, sometimes explicitly right-wing politics. They have a relationship with the Florida and the South, which allows them to get off the ground. But by the mid and late 1970s, mainly through the experience of people in jail, you have a section of that movement which is clearly moving to the left, clearly uh, a, 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 entertaining and, and uh, sometimes taking seriously left-wing ideas. So you get the, what, what calls itself the left uh, moving <coughs> fairly quickly to the right. What we would maybe characterize as having been the right wing in that split, uh, developing uh, left-wing, important uh, left-wing tendencies. And that's the paradox, I think, growing out of uh, the, the, the six, late 60s and early 70s. What was missing, I would argue, and, and I don't underestimate the, the difficulties of trying to sort of orient uh, one, a, a, a group in the, in the context of the late 60s and early 70s. But what was missing, I would argue, is Conley's combination of an unwavering anti-sectarianism, that is a, a principled opposition to sectarianism, that doesn't change according to which way the wind blows. and doesn't change even in the depths of uh, a crisis on the scale of August uh, 69. And uh, combining that with a, a kind of a dogged commitment to making every attempt to build uh, a working class unit. Not the kind of working class unit that, 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 that hides problems under the table, but the kind which can, uh, even if small at times, can begin to uh, rally people around a different vision, to, can begin to rally people around an anti sectarian uh, vision. And you can see this, I think, in relation to colleagues. Well, he didn't go through August 69, but he did go through the shipyard expulsions in 1912 and 1913, which are, you know, traumatic on the same scale uh, for Belfast in, in, in this period. And it's instructed to look at the way that Colin responds to the expulsions. The, inside the nationalist community generally, the church 
and the Nationalist Party, or become the Nationalist Party politicians, attempt to organize a communal response, which basically uh, organizes meetings of Catholic workers um, aimed at sort of defending uh, the Catholic community. Colley's response, through the agency of the Independent Labor Party, is to organize, to attempt to organize, mass meeting in the heart of Belfast, which includes uh, Protestant workers, some of whom had also been expelled from the shipyards, on the same platform as, as uh, some of the, uh, the nationalists who have been expelled. I've got two minutes left. Right. <laughs> I'll go for, that's good, because I'll go some very, very complicated stuff quickly. By the early 70s, I would argue, the defensive posture that uh, Republicans uh, had been compelled to adopt in the aftermath of August 69 has developed and shifted into an armed campaign. Uh, and um, obviously this is a complicated issue, and I hope we can uh, maybe take it up in, in, in the discussion. I was in a talk by Tommy McCurney a couple weeks ago, and he made an argument which makes sense to me. The strength, the power of the <coughs> resistance in nationalist working class areas in the early 70s works because this campaign led by Republicans, in, in both factions of Republicans in the early period, coincides with mass mobilization with a mass insurgency among the nationalist working class. And you can see mass mobilizations around uh, the false curfew, around the uh, attempt to uh, take the bog side, around the anti-internment agitation, around the response to Bloody Sunday. Possibilities there of a movement on the streets that can, uh, that can offer uh, mass resistance to the, uh, both to the sectarian state and to the British Army. McCurney argues that after 75 that's no longer true. That you have instead an armed campaign sort of left out on its own without the social movement uh, uh, below it. I'm not going to say there's no support or, 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 or resistance, but there's a qualitative shift, he argues. Uh, I don't know if I would say it happens in 75 or whenever, but something changes. Um, at the same time, <clears throat> for uh, some in the, in, in the provisional movement especially, what had been a necessity to be argued to have been a necessity in August 1969 becomes elevated in some ways to, uh, to virtue. That is, a, 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 an armed and defensive campaign moves on to various phases of a, an offensive armed campaign with the stated objective of driving uh, the British out of Ireland through uh, military means. Uh, 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 an outcome that I would argue was not on the cards at any point uh, from the 19, mid 70s onwards. McCurdy argues that there are possibilities for a revival of the mass movement at various points in the after, after the mid-70s. The hunger strikes is one thing. When you see you know, the possibilities not only of uh, the movement spilling over the borders despite the efforts of state censors and so forth, but also the movement that spreads, that, 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 that catches hold internationally, that, that builds, uh, that's able to win uh, international uh, solidarity. But over and over again, uh, the possibilities or the orientation to building a mass movement is trumped by the uh, necessity of waging uh, an, effective, an effective war. That is, there's a choice to be made at, point, at crucial points, I would argue, between mass mobilization, that kind of strategy, and uh, a military campaign. I'll leave it at that. I'm sure there's, you know, points to be hashed out in, in the discussion. But fast forward, it just says something about calling in uh, 2011. I know some of you may know that we had an excellent result uh, in West Belfast uh, last night in the elections, and in Derry McCann got about 3,200 uh, votes, I think. And I expect on Monday that uh, the RD members will get a similar response, and possibly, uh, if they're really unlucky, they may be elected to city council. <laughs> but um, anyway, that means that there's anger out there. That means that there's a, a possibility of really rebuilding a resistance to, uh, to the to the, to the social world in, in the north, and people have obviously seen, you know, there's great depths of anger in the south as well. There's a possibility for the left to rebuild an effective resistance in this country, uh, an opportunity that we really haven't seen in a very, very long time, and I would uh, imagine most people in the room uh, would agree with that. For reasons that we really had no uh, choice in, and I'll end in one second, <laughs> uh, the left really was marginalized for the most part from the 69 on. 
very difficult to uh, make an argument about the possibility of building a mass movement rooted in, you know, working class union in the North. I believe that that situation, you know, I, I don't want to paint sort of uh, fairy tale visions, but, but that situation has changed to our favor in that there's deep anger to uh, the cuts, to the kind of neoliberal policies that the governments North and South are about to hand down, or have handed down, and that that uh, anger cuts across uh, communal divisions. I don't want to under underestimate whatsoever the, you know, the difficulties of trying to build uh, uh, a, a, I hate the word cross community, but you know, a, a, a movement that unites Protestant Catholic workers in the North against the cuts. But I do think that the left, the challenge for the left in the period ahead, and this includes uh, socialist activists uh, north and south, is to make ourselves relevant in a period when working class people are really under the blows that are coming from all sides. We have a chance to make ourselves relevant for the first time in many, many years, I think, and we have to take ourselves uh, seriously in order, in order to do that. In the north, I think that there is an argument, I, I believe, that we need to oppose, continue to oppose partition, but we do so on the same basis that Pauline did, that is, to talk about the effects of partition in upholding the divisions that keep Irish working class people weak, divided, unable to press their uh, demands. In the North, I believe we need to combine a fight against the cuts, against austerity, with uh, principled anti-sectarianism. That, that doesn't change uh, from, from one minute to the next, but we need to do both things. Always be trying to reach out for the broadest layers of people that will fight against the cuts, and at the same time, uh, be there to, uh, to put ourselves uh, on the line against uh, sectarianism. Uh, so, I mean, I would say, uh, you know, Conley lived, if you think about the, 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 the length of his life, political life, 30 plus years, you know, in the socialist uh, movement. Um, maybe two or three big moments in that, you know, Belfast, Dublin, uh, 1916, you could say, moments when his politics caught traction among a wider layer of people, right? We are in, we are entering uh, that kind of moment, I think, that kind of historic moment, when people on the left, uh, socialists, Republicans, have an opportunity to make ourselves relevant to much wider layer of people than we've ever been, ever talked to before. It's not about, you know, quiet discussions in the corner of the public. It's about the possibility of building mass movements that can turn these governments uh, around and put the